So Barry Snyder, you and I are friends on Facebook and mm-hmm. periodically there is a, some kind of a cultural reference or a film reference. And I remember that you are a film reviewer and a, a, actually a professor of mm-hmm. media studies. You can correct me of the proper title, but you love movies. And I thought we could talk a little bit about the recent uh, Werner Herzog film, Fireball, and just maybe about Herzog in general. But first, just remind us of your um, your CV, your your uh, oh your teaching credentials. Yeah. So my background, um, I studied film film at college. So my background is in film studies, and yes, I I uh, reviewed films for the Vanguard Press back in the day. Um, some other publications. I um, was involved with various film efforts in town, um, um, helped start the, uh, along with Eric Ford, the Burlington Film Society, which was later incorporated into the Vermont International Film Festival um, Foundation. Um, I also was a, a board member, president of the board of the Film Foundation for, for a number of years. Um, and then um, I was head of the film program at Burlington College for, for 10 years as well. So I've had a life uh, involved in film among other um, vocations. And let me just ask you kind of the, a big question, which is in this time of short media assets or production and shorter mm-hmm. attention spans, what place do you think film has and sh- should continue to have in our media landscape and our cultural landscape? Well, it's very, very important. It's a big topic too, um, seeing the, you know, the, the strain that uh, theaters are under right now. So, you know, that, that theatrical experience is, I think, the thing that we're going to if it disappears, I don't think it will disappear completely. But increasingly, we're um, viewing films on devices. It's funny that we still call them films. Um, and um, that theatrical experience is so important, I think, as a, a um, as a larger than life experience, as a something that you do in a, in a collective setting, um, it's, it's really essential. Um, and um, also, you know, that it's a, it's a, it's a large question, um, what's happened to our attention spans and, and what that means. I think people don't have patience for films that are slower, you know, the art cinema kind of, kind of films um, that require, that, that you don't simply fall into, um, that require that you bring something to it and have to pay attention. And um, I'm a great advocate for cinema in all its dimensions, but particularly at, that that's at risk of being lost. Um, Ironically, talking about Herzog, it's one of Herzog's, you know, peeves. He has a lot of uh, a lot of peeves and a lot of uh, problems with uh, aspects of, of contemporary society that he goes off on in his in- interviews. But um, that is certainly one of them. Um, he thinks we we live in a time when images have been abused and have become useless and he blames commercial TV um, for for a lot of it um, and he sees cinema or at least what what he would uh, define as cinema as um, um, in have, having that that capacity that cinema has to inspire awe once again so you know, all those things I think we're at, at risk of losing as we move into the virtual world and live inside of the virtual world. Um, you know, there's another side to it in terms of uh, um, what now the, the series, the kind of streaming 
streaming series and uh, um, and and these various platforms that are now underwriting the production of films um, um, of of the sort that could not be made in terms of mainstream cinema. So there's all these directors now, including Herzog, who are, are finding a means to uh, still make films and have them seen, even if it's not in a theater. But um, it's gonna be interesting when we finally get out of this lockdown to see what happens with theaters. They've been under stress for some time now, and this, you know, this could be pretty much the death now. Yeah, the collective experience is so vital. And you know, while you're talking, what I, I think about, for me, what film really does that television doesn't, is not only you know watching it in a big space with lots of other people, but you can't really experience humanity in a quick way. Like, the, like what film allows you to do is unfurl the human experience so you can actually look at it and examine it. And that takes sure. time. Yes. And I think that's one of the real virtues. And I think it's also one of the strengths of Herzog. So why don't we, you know, talk about him? He, he's got a new film called Fireball. I think that's the name of it. Yes. It's about meteors. And just before we talk about that film, let's just look at his career briefly. I mean, for people who are my age, uh, you know, one of the pieces that really stands out was The Burden of Dreams, you know, the film that he made, well, Fitzcarraldo, and then, which is about this man who wanted to build an opera house in the middle of the Amazon and actually, you know, takes the organ over these mountains. And, yes. and Herzog was so committed to verisimilitude that he actually had the actors carry this over the mountain yes. um, and, and there's a film made out of of it called burden of dreams by i think less blank blank well, right which tells a story but you know why would a director go to that length um to recreate reality when they could just create the fiction in the film yes um um he's uh, he has this thing about truth in in cinema um, he famously um, derides uh, cinema verite, um, which he says is a cinema without, with only superficial truth. Um, so in his films, he's often gone to extraordinary lengths, including um, fictionalizing his documentaries, um, crossing those borders constantly. But in regard to Fitzcarraldo, um, he has this idea that by actually moving that ship and, and you know, the, the actual story that it's based on, it was a, a 30 ton ship. Oh, it's a ship, not an organ, a ship. Yes. Yeah. A ship. Okay. Yeah. A ship. The story is about... Uh, someone who is obsessed with bringing opera to, to the Amazon, deep in, deep inside the Amazon. And uh, the actual story involved a, a 30 ton ship um, that they dissembled to take over the mountain at a portion of the river that they couldn't navigate. Um, but um, Herzog had a 300 ton ship <laughs> and decided to haul it over the mountain at you know, and putting putting people's like the the less blank film goes into this. Uh, nobody was actually killed. That was part of the rumors, and there's always rumors and and misinformation and mythology that swirls around Herzog. Um, but he definitely people's lives were at risk. I mean, it was an extraordinary um, arduous task to pull this over this mountain, pull this. Um, ship over the mountain. Um, he had belatedly rationalized it as uh, that, that you can, especially, and this comes to the fore in the era of special effects, but that, that it, it, it 
imbues the film with something that you can't get by virtue of special effects. And he's always after this quality of awe. Um, he wants, he, he sees it as an essential quality of, of cinema, this sense of awe. And, um, and, and, and that was one of the ways that he went about it. Um, he, he um, does this commonly in, in his films. And you think before this, uh, the film that brought him to the attention of an international audience was Aguirre, Wrath of God, which was shot in Peru. And also, you know, I, I rewatched that not too long ago. And he has his cast on rafts going down these rapids. And he, he does these things. And, you know, he's, oh, he's broke, you know, he's filmed places where he shouldn't film. And he does all these sort of things. But, um, but that's, that's Fitzcarraldo. Um, and yes, he came, he came of age, uh, he comes out of what was referred to as the new German cinema. And this period of turmoil in uh, Germany where the industry, you know, Germany was of course occupied by the allied forces and the industry over the intervening years had uh, for various complicated reasons ended up being, um, uh, did become vital anymore. It was underfunded after a while. It was in competition with uh, the Americans, uh, film, Hollywood films that, that filled the screens, this and that and the other thing. Um, and um, in the 60s, in that period of agitation, young filmmakers issued this manifest, manifesto demanding funding for cinema and it resulted in um, the national cinema being subsidized by the by the state and gave the opportunity for all these young filmmakers um, to enter the scene and make movies and was embraced even though there was a strong political content in the films of these filmmakers um Rainer Werner Fassbinder and um, um Wim Wenders and Margaret von Trotta and Volker Schlondorf all these people Along, uh, along with Herzog, um, even though it had strong political content, um, it was embraced by the state because it um, projected internationally this image of, their, uh, of, of liberalism, which did uh, the Willy Brandt um, government uh, well. So um, there were a lot of young filmmakers um, who benefited from this and the cinema in Germany had been basically destroyed because of uh, because of the rise of Hitler and the aftermath. So uh, Herzog refers to these new German uh, cinema filmmakers as orphans. They were orphans, you know, cinematically. They didn't have the masters. They had to go back to the sil the great silent period for. Um, uh, masters of films. They didn't have mentors. They didn't have fathers. Uh, so they brought something very new to films. And, um, um, and lo and behold, and because underwritten by the state and promoting the interests of the state culturally in an indirect way, they were, prom they were promoted by the Goethe Institute and things like that. Um, these, these filmmakers became um, they became front and center on the, on the international stage. So that's where Herzog enters. Uh, he made his first films when he was in his 20s. Um, famously, again, he, one of his pet peeves is, is film schools. He was self-trained. He never made it through. He went to the University of Munich and never made it, made it through. Um, he stole a film camera, a 35 millimeter film camera from the Munich Film School um, to make his, his first film. He said he had a natural right to it as a tool. Um, and there's always been this sort of guerrilla element um, to, his, to his filmmaking. He, he, 
you know, he's uh, filmed where he shouldn't film and been thrown in jail and, and done things that are, you know, from one point of view might be considered unethical. The less blank bird in the dreams gets into that question of his exploitation of the, of the natives and hauling the ship over the mountain. But, um, but um, that's where he comes onto the scene and he makes a uh, Gary is uh, the breakthrough film and then Fitzcarraldo and a number of other films. But he's been at it um, for now, he's 78. And he's been at, he has like over 60 films to his credit. Um, he's found a way early on, he, and he, he, he claims he's, he's never made it, he's never gone over budget. So he's found a way um, to make films and to continue to make films, which is an extraordinary, extraordinary feat. Uh, and make films that, that are so distinctive in terms of their personalities, um, the films that he wants to make. So he's, he's very singular in that way and in other ways in terms of his personality. Um, two thirds of those films are, are documentaries. So right from the start, he was making documentaries. And like I said before, he was also crossing that, that line between fact and fiction. Um, he'd often have uh, non-actors play parts and, and he's, he appeared, he's become, I don't, I don't know of any other filmmaker who has as large a, a public presence and a public persona as Herzog, even surpassing Hitchcock. Uh, you know, he's, he's well known for him as himself. And, you know, he's a, a voice actor, but he also performs as himself in, in movies and has played characters. He's in the, um, the Jack Reacher film with Tom Cruise. He plays a villain in that. And, and that, that sense of awe, I'm glad you mentioned that because Fireball, which I, I wanted to yeah. hear your assessment of, is really about awe and cultural response to that. So why don't you just start actually by telling the story that you related in Facebook, if you don't mind, about your family oh. witnessing the meteors. Yes. Um, when I saw Fireball, um, Visitors from Darker Worlds, that's a, the full title, um, it, it brought to mind something that I hadn't recalled in years, which was an incident, I must have been 10 or 12, um, in eastern rural Pennsylvania. I grew up outside of a small town in eastern Pennsylvania. And we were in our backyard um, having an over the fence chat with our, our neighbors. Um, and something caught our eye and we all looked up and it was a boulder that filled our field of view. Moving across the sky at a seemingly slow pace um, and um, we were just in total astonishment and a little scared it was like so unusual we were just um, breathless at, at this site and it it crossed our field of vision um, the kids who were present I, I and some others ran up the hill because we were sure it was going to crash you know the next field over um, and it went out of sight we didn't know what to make of it um, we I, I think we we had we must have heard of meteors um, but uh, and so we assumed it was that but in, you, the days before internet or we didn't know who to turn to. I think there were some suggestions that maybe we should call the police, <laughs> to let them know. Um, but that's where it stood. I, I, I think someone had uh, later looked in, a, found in a newspaper uh, word of a meteorite hitting in upstate New, New York or something like that. So it might have been the same one. But obviously, what we saw was a, was a meteorite. I remember it had a little bit of a trip. It wasn't a fireball because it was in the atmosphere. 
I think our sense of the size of it, and my recollection was that it was this, this boulder you know, size, this huge thing going across the sky. That probably has to do with the same optical illusion by which we, when we see the moon rise above the horizon, it looks so huge. But in any case, it was awesome. It was an awesome sight and an awesome experience. Um, and um, watching, watching Fireball brought, brought, brought it all back to me. And uh, Fireball uh, visitors from Darker Worlds is, is awesome. You know, Herzog ha has expressed his, his desire to, uh, the, the cinema that doesn't evoke awe, you know, like cinema verite in, in his view, um, is not worth the, 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 worthy of the title of cinema. So it's something that he consciously goes after. And um, this is his uh, second collaboration with Gl Clive Oppenheimer, who is a volcanologist. In 2016, the two of them, he first met him in, in his documentary Encounters in, um, uh, Encounters in uh, At the End of the World, um, which is about Antarctica. So he encountered Clive Oppenheimer, who is a volcanologist. They, they got together in 2016, they made another film that's really worth watching called Into the Inferno, which is about volcanoes. Um, so they've been on this, well, not only in these films, but in, in Herzog's other documentaries like uh, Cave of Forgotten Dreams. He, he's a, a real, um, he has a deep interest in science and um, I heard him talk about Fireball on the uh, Bill Nye, the science guy, his podcast. And he talked about what science and movies have in common is this sense of awe or, you know, the, the awesomeness of, of the things that science uncovers. So he tries to, that, that's his goal in making these films. And, um, and indeed, I would say they're, they're very successful in that regard, in, in terms of that combination. Um, the other thing that he, he does, um, he, ha he is, um, you know, he's such a, uh, um, a contrarian and, you know, he, he, he doesn't like the National Geographic model um, for making films about exotic places or, or, or science, science uh, subjects. So um, he's in quest of a, a new model. He, he intends to be making these films are, um, he views them as, as a, a new model for this kind of science film or film about a, a, a subject of interest to science. And always incorporated into him is a cultural element. From, from the start, he's been interested in other cultures. Um, you can see that in Gary and Fitzcarraldo. In his fiction films, in his documentaries, um, in, in, in some ways, uh, there's, a there's a strong ethnographic element in his films. So Fireball, um, besides going to all these places where um, meteors have hit the earth, um, these amazing basins like uh, uh, um, on the uh, north of the Yucatan coast is one of the most famous ones that white, uh, you know, the dimensions of it is just unimaginable. And that was the one that wiped out the dinosaurs. Um, so when he goes to, besides that dealing with those things, or wherever he goes, he encounters um, peoples, for example, um, and their religious rituals that seem to carry echoes of, of uh, the thing that he's talking about. He does this in uh, Into the Inferno as well. And um, 
so there are these cultural elements and then there are the scientists themselves. And rather than having, you know, he's academia is one of Herzog's pet peeves. So his, his films do not have these uh, talking heads in front of charts and things like that. But he, he has a very keen sensibility. Uh, he really likes people and he picks up on people. So the scientists that, that he interviews at these various places are, are such interesting characters and their enthusiasm um, carries that sense of awe as well. Um, so it's a combination of those, those elements and it's, it's just, uh, just terrific. And does he collaborate with um, the volcanologist Yes. In the research or do they script it together or how does he put the story yeah. together with others? Um, it's, a, it's a good match. They, they make a good match. Um, the volcanologist, you know, he's a, a, a true scientist. Um, but in terms of discovering these subjects, uh, um, they discover them together or, uh, I think it was uh, Clive Oppenheimer uh, after Into, Into the Furnace who called um, Herzog's attention to meteorites. Um, and um, so they collaborate in terms of where they might shoot, where, where they might go and who they might uh who they might interview and, and all those sort of things. That's a matter of collaboration. The way Herzog is now working it, he's behind the camera and, and Clive Oppenheimer is the presence on camera and doing these interviews. And, and he has a wonderful personality. Um, he's, he's really has a great presence on screen. So it's a, it's a nice combination that they bring. And, and you know, uh, Herzog, they both have this this sense of awe and wonder and totally into the subject that they're talking about. Herzog tends to want to go into the kind of the metaphysical dimensions. Um, and that can, you know, th there are times when he's uh, um, more clear about what he's talking about. There's times when when he can come off as, it can come off as kind of a a mysticism or a, you know this this dark foreboding, you know the sort of thing that he's famous for. In fact, it it's, it becomes kind of self parody after a while at it, at its worst. Um, so having Owen um, uh, or Clive Oppenheimer as the mouthpiece is is good. Yeah, so you enjoyed the film. It's overall, it was, you liked it, thumbs up? Like four Absolutely, yeah. it's, it's terrific. I, it just, um, it's, it's very good and it has that sense of awe. You just can't help, uh, but uh, the, the things that come into view and the, the, the things that are discussed, uh, like the momentousness of, uh, of what has ha happened when meteors have struck the earth and um, people going around finding um, dust um, or these tiny bits of, of meteors. Um, there's, one, there's an interview with a jazz musician who um, has taken this up as his uh, avocation and, and uh, Googled um, use Google Earth to, to find the flat roofs and found one in, in I think, the, is it uh, in Australia somewhere and goes up on his roofs and he's found a way for picking up um, particles that are from, from space, uh, particles of space dust. And he has another person that he's got to photograph these at 3000 times. And there are these incredible landscapes. Some of the forms of these things are uh, unknown in nature because they were formed in, uh, in our 
um, in our world, these forms that, that these, uh, these small uh, particles from space take because of their, um, um, because they're subject to these forces uh, in space, the, the forms that they take under magnification are just absolutely incredible. Um, and, you know, they get into this idea of uh, where humans have this in common with these rocks, we're all made of the, we're made of stardust. Um, funny thing I, I wanted to mention about, uh, you know, Herzog, get, sometimes he can come off as, as, a, as a mystic, but he's not, he's really a hard science guy. And in this interview with Bill Nye about, about Fireball, about the film, um, Bill Nye brought up this thing that Carl Sagan says that, uh, um, that we're made of stardust and, and humans are something like humans are a, a way of the cosmos looking back at itself. So Bill, in this conversation with Herzog and Oppenheimer about the film, Bill Nye brings up this idea. He's really enthusiastic about this idea of humans as a, a, a way for the uh, cosmos to look back at himself. And Herzog, Herzog brings him up short and um, asks him what he's trying to sell them about the consciousness of the cosmos and accuses Bill Nye, the science guy of, of, of a new age uh, psych, uh, pseudoscience babble. So he's really hardcore in terms of being a, an atheist and, and having a, a kind of a scientific view. Um, and there, there's, you know, that, that subtitle, Visitors from Darker Worlds, there's a, there's a darkness to, to Herzog. And, uh, you know, this, this apocalyptic element that meteorites uh, that you have to encounter, uh, you encounter in the idea of uh, exploring the subject of meteors. And this is a part of the film as well, the, the fact that, uh, you know, meteors have struck the earth and they're gonna strike, strike the earth again. In fact, there's a segment where he interviews, there's a, um, I can't remember the name of it, but there's actually a, um, an institution in, in, uh, in the government that is constantly keeping an eye and has a plan for if they encounter, if they view um, a meteor that's gonna strike the earth. Um, so there's there, th that prospect that, it, that it's gonna happen, it could happen, it has happened in the past with absolutely you know, overwhelming catastrophic effects on the planet and life on the planet is a part of the awe of, uh, of, of the subject. Well, I really appreciate that. I can't wait to see it. It's on Apple TV, so. It is. I can get, I can do my subscription. And Into the Inferno is on Netflix. Oh, is it? Okay, good. Yeah. Well, that's, that's excellent to know. So let me just ask you before we wrap up, I really appreciate this conversation. What's in your queue? What films are you looking forward to watch over the next few weeks that you haven't seen yet? Or maybe you've seen and want to watch again. Um, having seen this and talking about Herzog, I wanted to revisit uh, a, a bunch of his films, um, Heart of Glass and um, some others. Um, I don't have uh, a whole lot in the, in the queue right now. Uh, I saw, I, I read something online about uh, European, uh, a selection of European films on, on Netflix and included Fahardi, the Iranian filmmaker, has a new film out there um, that I hadn't heard of before. I really, I really like him a lot. Um, so that's on the queue. Um, I, I watch uh, Turner Classic Movies a lot. So I, I rewatch things and uh, occasionally will discover something that I haven't seen before. Um, 
those are the things that, that come to mind. Well, that'll be interesting. Maybe when um, you watch the Iranian film, we can talk about that because- Oh, sure. He's a great filmmaker and really interesting stories about the life, his life and in the politics yeah. and, but, and the regular people. And it's just oh. quite rich, rich film. Very much. Yeah. Very much. Yeah. yeah, so maybe we can talk about that. It would be good Iranian film. I'd love to talk to you about that. Awesome. Well, Barry Snyder, thank you, Professor Snyder, <laughs> for talking with us about um, Werner Herzog's most recent films and some of your, and also that was really interesting about German cinema history. I'm really, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And I see there's a little Fritz Lang book behind you, which of course ah. is part of that tradition, you know, the even going back yeah. to your, what a great filmmaker he was. And you've got David Lynch. So you've got all the sort of unusual filmmakers on your bookshelf back there. Nice to see. I, I might mention um, F.W. Murnau, uh, Herzog made a, remade um, Nosferatu. Um, oh, and that's he, good. The, that would be good to watch. Yes, yes. Oh With my God. With what? With Klaus Kinski. Oh, in it, yeah. Just the other side of the whole Herzog story. I yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Well, we've got. I've got some films to catch up with, and okay. um, we'll talk again. Okay. Um, that would be great. Thanks. So nice to see Let's, you. Thanks for joining. So nice us. to see you.